Hello and welcome back to Philosophy Roulette. This is number 51. Uh, this morning we had a nice paper from uh, Mahdi Hamad, Homadzadeh, okay, on emergentism and sadhu psychology. And uh, but I had seen uh, some stuff had come out recently, and I was like, you know what? I don't have to randomly select every time because um, this came out a uh, special issue of N. Rohar. So uh, C, it's I and is fixed on Anscombe and Wittgenstein on animals and intention. I saw that this was um, not that long, so hopefully I can get it right now while you're here. This is very reasonable looking. Let me just uh, throw the uh, links in the uh, chat, as it were. So if you are here live, you can type exclamation point paper, and um, this link will pop right back up for you, so you can. Uh, Follow along if you so choose. And there we are. Okay. So, good to go. Uh, no abstract. Hopefully, uh, hey, that's Portuguese. I think that's Portuguese. I don't even know. I'm bad at things. Okay. Here we are. <coughs> Elizabeth Anscombe famously criticizes her teacher Ludwig Wittgenstein for talking about the natural expression of an intention in philosophical investigations. I will consider recent responses to this dispute by Mike, Michael Burley, Richard Morin, and Martin Stone, and Martin Gustafson. Burley's response, I will argue, is incomplete. A further understanding of the issue can be gained by learning from both Morin and Stone and from Gustafson, who disagree with them. The two papers by these three authors are very largely correct, but each contains a significant flaw. Anscombe is less concerned about defending Aristotelian or Thomas metaphysics than Gustafsson takes her to be, while Morin and Stone are wrong to argue that intentions must be verbalized in order to be judged correct or incorrect. More positively, I argue that Anscombe's criticism of Wittgenstein is correct, and more importantly, that understanding both why this is and exactly what she is and is not saying helps us understand the concept of intention. Like Wittgenstein's work, Anscombe's can be rather compressed and working through the details implicit in it. Details which are brought out very carefully by Morin and Stone and by Gustafson gives a fuller and clearer view of the concept of intention. In order to decide whether Anscombe's criticism of Wittgenstein is correct, we should first consider the evidence. Wittgenstein asks, what is the natural expression of an intention? Look at a cat when it stalks a bird or a beast when it wants to escape. In his remarks before the, this passage, Wittgenstein was considering the idea of intention as an inner experience or sensation, and he does not appear to think much of this idea. Instead of looking narrowly in order to find the particular thing that an intention might be, Wittgenstein wants to look more widely at the context in which one acts with a certain intention. In section 643, he writes that, If now I, sh I become ashamed of an incident, I am ashamed of the whole thing, of the words of the poisonous tone, and so on. What mean thing did he say? <laughs> in the following section, in response to a claim that I might be ashamed and not of what I did, but of the intention with which I did it, he asks, and didn't the intention lie also in what I did? What justifies the shame? And the whole background of the incident. Oh, not and. Just the whole background of the incident. So he's drawing out our attention repeatedly to the whole thing and the whole background. In section 647 itself, after the remark that An Anscombe criticizes, he adds, connection with the propositions about sensations. Wittgenstein does not deny that sensations exist or that they are particular things, although he might regard that way of putting the point across as of putting the point across as potentially misleading, but he does think that if we want to understand propositions about sensations, then we ought to examine the role of such propositions in our lives, including the way we learn to use and respond to them. Famously, he points out that inner processes need to have outward criteria if we are able to talk about them. See 
of Section 580 of Wittgenstein 2009. This might apply to intentions just as much as it does to sensations. So generally speaking, Wittgenstein diverts attention away from a narrow focus on intentions themselves, as if they were inner obje objects of some kind that we might understand better if we were to scrutinize them more closely, and instead encourages us, us to look more at the wider context in which we talk about intentions and the background against which we do so. Responding to the first non-parenthetical -parenthet part of section 647, Anscombe writes, Intention appears to be something that we, ha that we can express, but which brutes, which, for example, do, do not give orders, can have, though lacking any distinct expression of intention. For a cat's movements in stalking a bird are hardly to be called an expression of intention. One, one might call, well call a cat a car's stalling the expression of its being about to stop. Intention is unlike emotion in this respect, that the expression of it is purely conventional. We might say linguistic if we were to allow certain bodily movements with a conventional meaning to be included in language. Wittgenstein seems to me to have gone wrong in speaking of the natural expression of an intention. Okay. Wittgenstein refers to, at different times to the natural expression of sensation and the natural e expression of intention. This, like the parenthetical remark in 647, might suggest a similarity between sensation and intention that Anscombe wants to deny. But Wittgenstein's 647 is reminiscent of Investigations 256, where he asks, But suppose I didn't have any natural expression of sensation, but only had sensations. The word for expression here. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to read the German, here suggests linguistic expression, which is what Anscombe seems to have in mind, but the qualifying adjective natural suggests that Wittgenstein is not talking about anything merely conventional. In, two, in section 257, he talks about groans and grimaces as manifestations of pain. Presumably, presumably this is the kind of thing he has in mind in 256 when he refers to natural expressions of sensation. He uses different wor a different word for expression in 647, and indeed the movement of a stalking cat seems further from language proper than a groan of pain. But it still seems right to say that these movements show something about what the cat is up to, something that will help us predict and understand its movements. Why not call this an expression of intention? Burley's view is that the disagreement between Wittgenstein and Anscombe is due to an ambiguity in the word expression. His point is that a cat cannot voluntarily reveal its intention. However, it might not, nevertheless non-voluntarily exhibit or display its intention. This seems right, but Anscombe does not deny it. Her claim is that unlike emotion, and I would think a sensation such as pain, intention has only conventional, not natural expression. Okay, search the internet for the cat that's like stalking a bird and then the bird like flies off. The cat flops on its side and like utter just like disappointment there is no mistaking the intention that the cat was like attacking the bird and then when the bird just like saw him and just like took off immediately it just like flops over like complete dejectedness so it is the cat in that instance is completely unlike a car because not only or maybe you were projecting the intention but the cat's reaction to the bird uh just leaving quickly is completely in line with the cat having the intention that we thought it had because you can just see the like utter dejected disappointment in the cat because like it's standing like pound ready to pounce and then just like Fleh. okay so i'm gonna have to go with the uh wittgenstein's quote is well i'm just have to be on the wittgenstein side not on the anscombe side at the moment in order to see why burley's plausible suggestion does not solve the problem we need to be clear about what about exactly what anscombe's point is Perhaps it might be best to clarify what Anscombe is and is not saying by attending to the exegesis offered by Morin and Stone and then to Gustafs in response to this. Each of these papers is mostly but not completely right, and the two together provide almost all the illumination I think we need. The point is of the present paper is to provide the rest. Morin and Stone start by asking why Anscombe brings the expression of intention at all in her initial account of three contexts in which we make use of the con concept of intention. Their whole paper is an answer to this question, and I will not summarize all of it here, but a key part of their answer is this. With the verbal expression of intention, a discontinuity with natural manifestation arises, and it is this that Anscombe seeks to mark. So, ver with verbal expression, a discontinuity with natural manifestation, all right. Such expressions, and so it's a, something between verbality and naturality. Such expressions introduce something new, a characterization of what one is doing, what larger actions one, one's actions are part of, 
or toward which they are aimed. Expressions of intention are thus world-directed, but not just in the way that expressions of states like belief or, hopes are, or hope are. They make possible the application of the notion of mistake of, to performances, and they express practical commitments. Emotions such as fear or joy can be naturally manifested, and we can learn to say, for instance, I am afraid or I am happy, to, <coughs> to supplement or replace these manifestations. Expression of intention, however, are different because they involve a kind of commitment. If I say I was happy but I am now sad, then my mood has changed. I have not made a mistake. Whereas if I said that I intend to catch a certain train and then do not, my intention has changed. Either I lied, as I might equally do about being happy, or this is the important difference. I failed to do what I intended to do. We can, if we can, if we want to call certain forms of behavior expressions of intention, but it is important not to lose sight of the difference between verbal expressions of emotion and verbal expressions of intention. Moran and Stone put the point this way. Rather than standing in for performance, expressions of intention have a force that no bit of natural behavior could have. Specifically, they make contradictable claims. They require that something else does then be regarded as correct or mistaken. Um... Uh, perhaps. I mean, there might be some, like, edge cases there, but where you're both saying something and uh, as, like, sort of a natural reaction, but uh, it's a reasonable point that the act of making a verbal uh, account of something does not usually, I mean, it, it's not in itself the intention. It's a some sort of description, and so it's the expression thereof is not... Um, it's in just being in the language. It's sort of the content of the language, not being made by talking. Okay, it's made by the content. Verbal expressions of intention are especially important, they argue, because the importance placed by Enscombe on the question of whether and why an agent is behaving as they are. The question seems to require a verbal response. Because an intentional act can be performed correctly or incorrectly, which seems to require an independent standard by which to judge it. And a verbal expression of intention provides such a standard. And because only a verbal expression of intention can directly display the unity of intention as it occurs in intending to X and in intentional action. One might wonder, given the importance of verbal expressions of intention, just as outlined, whether nonverbal beings can have intentions. Anscombe clearly believes they can, or at least that there is nothing in the matter with ascribing intentions to them as we often do. In her paper, under description, she gives the example of a bird that lands on a twig that has been smeared with bird lime in order to peck at bird seed. I don't know what bird lime is. Under the description landing on the twig, the bird's action was intentional, she says, but it was not so under the description landing in bird lime. Mormon and Stone note these cases. In these cases, we apply the descriptions under which the creature's action is intentional. That is, the bird need not think of any such descriptions. Rather, language users apply them to the bird's behavior, partly on the basis of what we believe to be good for the animal in question. Unfortunately, they do not explain fully the basis on which we apply such descriptions, and what they say on the subject will lead them into trouble, as Gustafson points out. I will spell out his objection more fully below, but begin with an example of a problem in what, in what they say. Just as the engine's behavior indicates the car is going to stop only if the car is going to stop, so the movement of the cat indicates only what it is actually going to do. However, if what the cat goes on to do is to walk into a trap, rather as the bird in Anscombe's example lands in bird lime, then, is, then its previous movement did not only indicate what it was actually what it actually goes on to do. They indicate, if anything, some other intention. And this intention might be quite obvious as when an animal takes the bait in a trap. Anscombe's understanding of intention, as Gustafson understands it, is significantly influenced by Aristotle and Aquinas. He argues that she understands animal intention, intention partly in terms of the ends proper to each species. <coughs> It is doubtful, however, that Gustafsson's Aristotelian reading of Anscombe is quite right. Certainly, Anscombe's work on intention was influenced by Aristotle as well as by Wittgenstein, as she makes clear in her book. But the nature of this influence does not appear to me to be as Gustafsson presents it. I will preface my criticism by saying that it is possible that Gustafsson would largely agree with my position. Much depends on exactly what he counts as knowledge of the ends of a species. His reference to Aristotle and Aquinas in this connection, however, suggests that he has in mind something more metaphysical or technical than the knowledge simply observed 
knowledge by simple observation, and common sense that I will focus on. Gustafsson rejects the account offered by Morin and Stone of what Anscombe says about the bird and that, that lands that landed on a twig in order to pack at seed we want to a description at seed we want a description of the bird's behavior that makes it intelligible given what we know the bird is seeking and what regards at as good for it. This seems quite right, but Gustafsson disagrees. All we get is unhelpful circularity. We are supposed to see a description of what the bird did when it which is comprehensible within what we already know that the bird is seeking, whereas the problem is to give an account of how the latter knowledge is possible in the first place. Hmm, okay. Gustafsson's concern is that Morton's don't allow us to project intentions onto animals that they do not actually have. If we rely on Aristotelian ideas about what is good for members of spe a specific species, however, then we can avoid arbitrariness and be true to Anscombe's preferred metaphysical commitments. In G Gustafsson's version, then we rely on ideas about what kind of activity is good for birds of this sort whenever we attribute a certain intention to one of them, and conversely, in saying that the bird's behavior is unintentional under the description, Landing on a twig with bird lime on it, we are presuming that getting stuck in bird lime is a hindrance rather than a conductive, conducive to the full fulfillment of aims that a bird has qua a bird of its kind. <coughs> Gustafsson agrees with Morin and Stone about the normativity of intention. That is, if I intend to do something, I might succeed or fail to do what I intended to do. Where he disagrees with them is on their suggestion that this normativity must be linguistic. A bird that lands on a twig coated with bird lime has done something that it did not intend to do, something that may well result in its death. But it gives and can give no verbal expression to its intention according to which behavior can be judged as correct or mistaken, as Gustafsson observes. There is no reason, and Anscombe sees no reason, to argue that non-linguistic behavioral manifestations of intention do not exhibit or convey the relevant standards of correctness. Her conclusion is the opposite one. Since certain, certain bits of natural behavior manifest intentions, those bits of behavior do exhibit the relevant standards of correctness. Goodstuffson notes that Morin and Stone might be aware of a difficulty in their positions here since they acknowledge that we sometimes see that someone is making a mistake. The example they give is of someone brushing a wall with a paintbrush that they've forgotten to dip in paint. They also use the expression barking up the wrong tree to describe such actions, which suggests another case, namely that of a hunting dog barking as if its quarry were in a tree that is actually empty. Morin and Stone go on to say, though, that here it is important that we grasp a particular description of what they are doing and or intending to do, one which a human being could give in answer to the question, why? This is correct, but the description need not actually be verbalized, and certainly not by the agent. If the behavior alone without a verbal expression does not make the intention involved clear, then it seems, Gustafsson notes, arbitrary, arbitrary what intention is attributed to the agent in such a case. When, when the agent is human, they could f correct false descriptions of what they are up to, but if the agent in question is a dog, then there is no such possibility. In that case, Gustafsson says, Str strictly thought through. Morningstone's sort of view entails that animals' intentionality is just a piece of anthropomorphic fiction. This, it seems to me, is an excellent diagnosis of one point on which Morin and Stone go wrong. But in trying to correct their view, Gustafsson himself errs. He writes that. According to Anscombe, in saying that the bird is acting with the intention to peck at bird seed, we are relying on the conception that pecking at bird seed is a good thing for birds to do of this sort. So it is evident that the bird in the example cannot be a sea eagle, for example. Anscombe does not say this, however, and is prob a problematic position to take. One problem with the view that Gustafsson attributes to Anscombe is that it seems to require us to know what kind of bird we are talking about and to know something about the needs and behaviors of that species. But it might be perfectly obvious given that given given bird is pecking at seed or trying to do so without one's knowing whether it is a sea eagle or not. It might similarly be clear that a dog is chasing a ball, even if it Doing so is not particularly good for it at qua member of its species. It might even be clear that the animal is trying to do something that is very bad for members of its species, as when a do dog tries to eat chocolate, which can be toxic for dogs, although it will not be trying to do so under a description of the act as, as one that is bad for the animal. A second problem is that in saying that a bird's behavior is unintentional under the description landing in bird lime, one might mean either that the bird has no idea that such things as bird lime make such thing as bird lime exists, or that it is landing on a particular twig despite the fact that it is covered with some funny looking substance. In the first case, the bird is simply oblivious. In the second, it is knowingly engaging in risky behavior. 
It is true that if we know what bird lime is, and that is an artificial product to, made to trap birds, we know that, well, now I know, I'm glad they told it me, we know that landing in bird lime is a hindrance to the fulfillment of the aims of birds that, or any other species. But knowing is not presuming. Gustafsson says, remember that in saying that a bird's action is unintentional under a particular description, we are presuming that the action is so described is a hindrance to the fulfillment of its aims. And not every act that is unintentional under certain circumstances is a hindrance to the fulfillment of an agent's aims. If I withdraw cash from an ATM that is both the nearest one to me and the second one ever installed in the city I'm in, then probably withdrawing cash unintentionally under, under the latter description, <coughs> I'm oblivious, but intentionally under the first. It does mean no harm to use a machine with this histor historic property, however. And something similar could go on, go for birds and the twigs they land on. They intentionally land on twigs that have properties relevant to their goals, but under descriptions that make no reference to those goals, their landing there is unintentional. It need not, therefore, be detrimental to them in any way. Perhaps in Anscombe's example, the bird lime does not actually work, and the bird gets away unharmed. Yeah, so it wouldn't... It, it did something that we thought was bad for it, but it actually didn't work out to be bad. So it was just, uh, we were wrong in attributing a bad intention to the bird because the bird was fine. You know, like, uh, I've seen rats get out of, uh, rat traps. It's like, well, it might have annoyed them for 30 seconds, but it wasn't really a big deal. I mean, lots of stuff annoy us. And, uh, we don't intention, intend for that. Um, so this might be, uh, there might be a little bit too much over, uh, projecting of intention onto things i mean i'm not feeling 100 percent uh, healthy at the moment don't think i'm gonna die but like it's just that's annoying but like did i intend to get sick no but that's okay it happens a third problem with what gustafson says about this is his insistence that the problem is to explain how we know what the bird is seeking it is tempting to say that we can see what it is seeking in which case this problem would not exist if a bird flies until it reaches a twig, then lands on it and moves along till it reaches some seed, which it then pecks at, then it its end in the sense of both its stopping point and its goal was the seed or pecking at the seed. But perhaps there are cases where it is not so simple. If the bird is a sea eagle, say, and we know that they do not peck at seeds. So this one might be unusually hungry or brain damaged or trying to do something else entirely to work out what is going on in such a case as this or to know that it really is a sea eagle. It might help to know that some biology, even then we would still need to keep in mind that birds like people can be very stupid and do not always behave in ways that are conducive to their well-being. If we want to know what a given animal is trying to do, then we should first and foremost look and see. If it is chasing a ball or trying to eat chocolate, and then catching the ball or eating chocolate is what it intends to do, and those are the correct non-arbitrary, non-projected descriptions of its behavior. We do not need metaphysical commitments to do this, and Anscom does not insist otherwise. Gustafsson raises the a question of how we know what a bird, say, is seeking, and suggests that we might need to refer to knowledge of what what is good and bad for members of its species in order to know and not simply project our own ideas onto its behavior. This is an understandable line of thought, but it does not appear to be Anscombe's. She explains in Intention how it is that intentional actions can be defined in terms of language, and yet intention-dependent concepts can be applied to animals. The reason is pr uh, precisely that we describe what they do in a manner perfectly characteristic of the use of intentional co of intention concepts. We describe further what they are doing in doing something, the latter description being more immediate, nearer to the merely physical. The cat is stalking a bird in crouching and slinking along with its eye fixed on the bird and its whisk whiskers twitching. This is why Gustafsson rightly says that Anscombe rejects talk of a cat's behavior expressing its intention. Its movements are... Its movements are its stalking the bird, and its stalking the bird involves or includes the intention to catch it. That is, stalking the bird rather than, say, merely walking near it, means that the cat is trying to catch the bird. Describing the action as stalking tells us what the cat intends. How, though, do we know this is the right description to use? Anscombe answers this with reference to not thinking about what is good and bad for the cats, but to, to looking. Mm -mm, looking. All right. Just as we naturally say, the cat thinks there is a mouse coming, so we also naturally ask, why is the cat crouching and slinking like that? And give the answer, it's stalking that bird. See, its eyes fixed on it. We do this, though, 
We do this though the cat can utter no thoughts and cannot give expression to any knowledge of its own action or any intentions either. Now see, this is where I'm disagreeing. There's that great video I, that you can like Google, like cat stalking bird, like fail or something, um, where you can see the obviousness of the reaction when it fails to, to catch the bird. And so the reference of the sort of like the physical failure, just like flopping over so dejectedly, does give a sort of re a reference back to what it had inten intended. So I'm not sure that behaviors can't also give, um, there are behaviors that could give knowledge of its action, that show that it had knowledge of its action and to give expression to it. Um, so yeah. It's like there there might be gradations of um, sort of behaviors. Like the dejected falling over is so obviously dejected falling over in that context that it sort of grounds the more sophisticated intention of stalking. Hmm. All right, I have to think about that. We also do this without any reference to special knowledge of what is conducive or harmful to the flourishing of cats. Gustafson argues that Anscombe equally regards intention in animals and in humans being as cases of intention but of different kinds of intention. Yeah, different kinds. Human intention is connected with language in a way that animal intention is not. Unlike human intention, the cat's intention to catch a bird exists only qua the cat's stalking. This is what makes it like the cat. This is what makes it like the car that is about to stop. The car has no intention, so it is also important different from the cat, but the symptoms of being about to stop are not really separable from the fact that it is about to stop, or at least not as separable as a human being's intention to do something is from the expression of that intention, which might after all be a lie. Unlike cats, human beings are also quite capable of acting against their biological interests. We sometimes do things because they are bad for us when one wants to commit suicide, for instance, as Anscombe notes. According to Gustafsson, in According to Gustafson, in the cat case, as conceived by Anscombe, the cat's intention to catch the bird is constitutively, constitutively bound up with the cat's non-conventional behavior. It's stalking the bird, and this constitutive nexus is intelligible in view of what sort of creature a cat is. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I think we understand stalking behavior without it even being a cat. You don't have to know what a cat is to know what stalking behavior is. You'd have to know something similar to a cat, but... Stalking is uh, more general than to cats. The characterization of the behavior qua directed at an intended goal, stalking the bird, is applicable because cats are creatures for which it is good to catch birds and because they have the biological equipment, sense organs, etc., need to aim at, a p at particular things like birds. If I am correct, the reason why Anscombe does not want to call the cat's behavior an expression of the cat's intention is that the constitutive interrelationship between the intention and the behavior is too tight to make the notion of expression applicable. This is different from Moran and Stone's view that expression of intention needs to be verbal because only a verbal expression can provide a criterion of correct execution. Behavior does not express intention according to Anscombe because the connection between behavior and intention is too tight, uh, to use Gustafsson's word. What I do achieve when my goal is intended, what I do to achieve my go intended goal embodies my intention in a way that cannot lie. Okay, I might walk down a certain street in order to make you think I'm going to a museum say, but then this walking embodies my intention to deceive you. It's not merely a deceptive act regarding my unreal intention to go to the museum. It is also a real act that shows unavoidably, unavoidably if unwittingly, my intention to deceive. <coughs> well, that, that old um, thing from like Kung Fu or whatever where there's like a student going up to a Kung Fu master and he tries to hide his voice. He says, the master says, yes, but you didn't hide your gate and I I heard you coming from a mile away speaking of how people walk and need to do uh, walk deceptively and nowadays it, uh, apparently we can uh, ID people by their gate uh, using artificial intelligence and so people can be tracked uh, in crowds based on how they're walking even if their face is invisible which is very creepy so yeah uh, does that relate here I don't think so but it's something to keep in mind. Might we not, even so, choose to say that actions embodying a certain intention express that intention? 
Gustafsson view is that Ansco means to stipulate that we ought not to speak this way when doing philosophy because of the danger of our doing so leading us astray in a Cartesian or empiricist way that treats intention as mental states that are not very different from sensations such as pain. This is precisely the kind of danger that Wittgenstein was concerned about avoiding. Gustafsson also notes that in colloquial use we only call something an expression of X if it is distinct from X itself. A cat stalking a bird, which it consists of its walking to towards it in a certain way, is not appropriately distinct from its intention to catch the bird. However, since without this intention, these movements would not amount to stalking. I can, inform, I can form an intention but not act on it yet, and if I change my mind, I might never act on it. But we cannot seriously attribute this kind of intention to an animal. I don't know about that. Why can't... Oh, we don't really know what the cat's thinking. Maybe it decides to do stuff... Well, I can guarantee you when I had cats, the cat, I'd call it, it would look my way and be like, nah, I ain't getting up. It considered it, it looked at me. So I'm not sure. It makes no sense to ascribe an intention to an animal whose behavior real, reveals nothing of the intention in question. Yeah, you get to know certain animals. You can kind of predict, just like people, what they're going to do in certain uh, times. And like you can see people thinking about stuff. And that's a problem. If you can see someone thinking and trying to work something out, you can see like the like, little gears in their brain like churning, like click, click, click. Then you are, this is the same thing that you sort of give to the cat. And they'd be like, you can see them trying like, should I do this or should I do that? And I'm not exactly, um, if we can do that for people, why can't we do that for animals? Like we can see like them waffling back, back and forth between two different um, choices. And so, if we can see people doing that, why can't we see animals doing that? Unlike human beings, animals cannot re reveal their intentions through language. So apparently, intentional behavior is the only criterion for the ascription of intentions to them. <coughs> However, I am not certain that Gustafsson is quite right about Anscombe's desire to distinguish non-linguistic animal intention from human intention. In her paper, Under a Description, which Gustafsson discusses, she addresses the following question. Animals that have no language can have intentions too. How then, it is, it is asked, can it be right to say that an intention is always under a description? To answer this question, she brings up the example of the bird that did not want to land on a certain twig, but did not want to land in bird lime. It did want to land on a twig, but not in the lime. So in doing both, it did what it wanted under one description, but not under another. Anscombe asked, now asks another question and answers it right away. If it landed on a twig in order to peck at the bird seed, can't we say it took landing on the twig to be a, a way of getting into a position to peck at the bird seed? We can if we say that the bird thinks it can escape by opening into the open by flying towards a daylight that comes through a glass barrier. On the one hand, this way of talking seems perfectly normal. On the other, it might seem to require the bird to be thinking to itself, perhaps in its own language, something along the lines, landing on the twig will be a way for me to get into the position to peck at the bird seed. Anscombe denies this, however. This way of talking, that is, the way exemplified in the passage about, quoted above, does not presuppose that the bird has any thoughts about descriptions. If there is a difficulty, it concerns ascribing those other thoughts to the bird. It is not about the passing from the bird's intentions or aims or, or to the descriptions of belief to it. But someone who says the bird's action was intentional or voluntary under one description, not under the other, need not enter into that dispute at all. It took landing on the wig to be way of, but not a way of. It merely it is merely a rather roundabout way of saying that, for example, the bird meant wanted to land on the twig, but not to land on the bird line. Landing on the twig was landing on bird line. We aren't considering two different landings. So if we form a definite description, the action then of landing on the twig, the action then of landing on the twig with bird lime on it, we must say that there are definite descriptions satisfied with the same occurrence, which was something that the bird did, but under one description it was intentional, under the other unintentional. That the bird is not a language user has no bearing on this. <coughs> Anscombe's response to the objection where she says both one, that animals have intentions but lack language, and two, that intentions, intention is always under a description says nothing about the animal's intention being different from human intention. Instead, she says that a bird not being a language user is irrelevant. The objection, she says, is in part of the passage above that I've omitted, supposes that her claim about intentions being under a description implies that a description is in some sense written into something inside the agent. 
but the implication is that Anscombe denies any such thing. So human intentions and animal intention do not appear to be two different things, at least this seems to be a misle misleading way of speaking. The difference is that humans having language can express their intentions while animals whose intentions may well nevertheless be visible cannot um, express their intentions with language here. Well, okay. So, or is that just a general statement? Mm, okay, let's just see. Enskom accuses Wittgenstein not so much of doing something bad, but of choosing words that are likely to mislead. This might seem a somewhat minor criticism, especially given both that Wittgenstein refers to natural expression of intention only once, and that there is no known case of anyone having been misled by this use of words. Um, I can guarantee you there is much in Wittgenstein that could be misread and misleading. So, no known case of anyone being misled by this use of words. Yeah, well... There's lots of misleading things, especially in Wittgenstein. <laughs> Nevertheless, her criticism of Wittgenstein is of interest beyond the question of whether Wittgenstein was right or wrong. Coming to understand her criticism, which we can perhaps best do with both, with help from both Morin and Stone and from Gustafsson, helps us see what is and what is not involved in the expression of intention and why this matters. As Morin and Stone make clear, an agent can fail to do what they intend to do, which makes intention different from emotion or belief. A sincerely verbal... Verbalized intention thus provides a criterion by which future action can be judged. As Gustafsson points out, however, ascriptions of intention to animals by humans will be arbitrary unless there is some basis in the animal behavior for such as ascription. Morn and Stone assert, problematically, that considered apart from their verbal expressibility, intentions are sunk into facticity. The movements of the cat only indicate what it actually goes on to do. <coughs> yeah, so it's just the fact that it is, but it shouldn't, it isn't a anything over than the uh, raw facts in the world. This fails to account for the kind of mistake we see when a dog barks up the wrong tree or a bird lands on a twig coated with lime. To avoid this mistake, Gustafs and Point posits that Anscombe relies on our knowledge of what is good or bad for members of various species, but this seems to complicate matters unnecessarily and is not what Anscombe actually says. What she says, and what seems right, is that at least sometimes we can simply see what an animal is trying to do. In this way, Gustafsson, having perceived the flawed Morin and Stone's account, takes a wrong turn himself. Going back to what Anscombe says helps to reveal a simpler solution to the problem. For what it's worth, she also appears to appears to be right to criticize Wittgenstein on this point. Talk of a natural expression of intention is potentially misleading, making it harder to see the subtleties brought out by Anscombe and the commentators on her work that I have discussed in this paper. Okay, that was fun. Do a little Wittgenstein uh, and some other stuff on intention. Haven't done uh, sort of thing before in philosophy roulette. That was good. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the question is just exactly it, the irrelevance of the language, understanding why it's relevant or not, that animals have language or not. Um, in some sense, we're being overly reliant on the language. And so that is what is getting in the way of, because we keep over-focusing on the language. And so that is what's getting in the way of uh, our understanding the intention of the animals. Because we don't, we have to understand for them it's sort of irrelevant, and we can tell just by their actions sometimes what's going on, which is a point I was trying to make with the kitty, which I suggest anyone who wants a few moments of uh, meme happiness to go and uh, find. Okay. That's it for now. I hope you have a good night. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you probably tomorrow. If not, maybe in two days, depending on how I feel. Bye-bye.